So we're spending our summer in the Psalms, and the Psalms are poetry. The Psalms are songs that we sing. The Psalms are prayers. And like all these categories, there are Psalms of lament and disorientation when the world doesn't make sense and when justice is absent of celebration and praise and orientation, when we align ourselves with God and we delight in God and we give praise, and psalms of new orientation, that psalms of movement from, from uh, the pit to uh, being in God's presence, uh, psalms of growth and change and some divine aha moments when the, when the, the author uh, of the psalm gets it and goes, oh, Wow, God is like that. Our psalm for today is Psalm 46, and it's a psalm of new orientation. And it goes like this. God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid, though the earth trembles and the mountains topple into the depths of the sea, though its water roars and foams and the mountains quake with its turmoil. There's a river, its streams delight the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is within her. She will not be toppled. God will help her when the morning dawns. Nations rage, kingdoms topple. The earth melts when he lifts his voice. The Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come, see the works of the Lord, who brings devastation on the earth. He makes wars cease throughout the earth. He shatters bows and cuts spears to pieces. He sets wagons ablaze. Stop fighting and know that I am God. Exalted among the nations, exalted on the earth. The Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. So we have three stanzas, and each one is separated by the Hebrew word selah. And while the meaning isn't really clear of this word, it is believed to mean a stop and listen, a kind of pause. If you're the musical type, you might think of this as a rest note, an invitation to stop playing, to pause, to rest. And so we'll dive in the first stanza. The first stanza hits home because it feels like our world. It's trembling. The mountains are toppling. Uh, Mountains, these are bastions of security and immovability. And yet here they are toppling. We can easily reflect on our own early pandemic experiences when the immovable mountains of our life toppled. That which we leaned on for security and safety, maybe family networks or secure employment or predictable rhythms, many of these toppled. And a question for us as we reflect today is like, what's currently teetering on the brink or toppling in your own life? So these mountains, they collide with the sea. And I can picture this beautiful coastline. I went to the East Coast when I was a teenager on a mission trip, and, and the seas crash into the rock formation and they cause the splash and the spray and, and such a loud noise. But here, we don't have the sea colliding into the mountains. We have the mountains falling into the sea. And I picture the intensity. Uh, the mountains are crashing into the sea and it's, it's an intensity that is tenfold what we might imagine. And in times such as these, our default posture is fear, fear of the unknown, fear of the uncertain, fear of this toppling happening to us, to our livelihoods, to our families, to our church. And it's important to know to name that the psalmist knows this, felt this, experienced this as well. But instead of starting with the toppling and fear and the uncertainty, the psalmist opens this prayer-like song with words of comfort. God is a refuge. God is a strength. God is a helper. I mean, yes, that's what he's saying, but also, no, God is not just a refuge, a strength, a helper. God is our refuge. God is our strength. God is our helper. There's something personal here. And and then we see, well, when does God show up? And it says, precisely in times of trouble, precisely when we need him most, 
He's always found in times of trouble. When everyone else is fleeing the scene, maybe because they're afraid or because uh, there's reason to run, God is arriving and God is present in those moments. I think of uh, maybe a humanitarian crisis, uh, maybe like the earthquake in Haiti in 2010, uh, we were at a church who one of our um, one of our leaders was was a Haitian uh, man who uh, he had lost contact with his family during this time. And I remember we came together to pray for him and support him and send support to Haiti. And, and just as the tumultuous experience like this sends people fleeing for safety, fleeing war zones, fleeing a uh, crisis, uh, humanitarian aid is going in. And so God shows up in like manner when our world, uh, when it feels like our world is in the midst of, uh, of tumult and crisis, when it feels like our church is falling apart, know this, God is present here. God can be found in precisely times like these. And then the stanza comes to an end with a selah, a pause, an invitation to reflect, a stop and listen. And so maybe we, maybe we be cautious to not move too fast past these. And so I want to pause for some silence and reflect on this question. What word or phrase is leaping off the page at you? The second stanza also feels like our world. Nations are raging, kingdoms are toppling. The raw and destructive power we saw in the first stanza of mountains and the seas in creation is now being experienced by our nations and our kingdoms. It's coming closer, it's drawing nearer. And just like the story in Genesis, the story of creation where God speaks clarity into the chaos, here we see that God lifts his voice. And when he does, the conflict, the violence, the toppling, the unraveling, the chaos, it all ceases. It all melts. And we are reminded once again that the Lord of armies is with us. In scripture, there's different names for God. Here, this one, this Lord of armies, is, is translated most literally to God of angel armies, sometimes as Lord of hosts or the, the Lord of a host of angels. It's a divine warfare, warfare name. It's, it's the God who commands the full power of heaven. And so it, we might ask as the reader, well, is he going to wage war on the nations and the kingdoms and the earth? And, and no, the God who possesses the full power of heaven comes, uh, comes to us in two comforts. First, his presence. He is with us. He is among us. He is here even now in the midst of this chaos, in the midst of this transitional season. And second, he offers us his protection. He's a stronghold, a fortress. That old song, the righteous run into it and they are safe. And all this points back to the first part of the second stanza, that it's a picture of God with us, of God uh, or us with God. It's a picture of a place that we are invited to, the presence of God where a river feeds it and the streams bring delight and, they, and God dwells there so that it's safe, there's safety there. When that which we think is, is most immovable, mountains and nations, when they topple, we are told that this place will not be toppled, will not be overcome because God is there and his help arrives as faithful as the sunrise. After a long night of struggle and fear and worry, God arrives as help with the morning dawn, like the morning dawn. I think of uh, this great picture in Lord of the Rings where uh, the, if you've ever watched it or, or read the books, uh, Helm's Deep is this iconic battle and they're hemmed into the side of a mountain and there's a wall and it's, it's, it's their only saving grace because they're outnumbered vastly. And uh, the battle wages all night. Um, I think in the book for, for, longer than that. Um, but, but here they're told, Gandalf is told, at dawn, look to the east. He says to them, at dawn, look to the east. And, and, and there, as the sun is creeping up over the horizon, there's a glimmer, a hope, because those words come back to them and all of their worry and all their fear and hopelessness they've been feeling just dissipates before them as Gandalf and the Rohirrim ride over along with the sun. And they can take a collective deep breath because they know help is here. And we can take a collective deep breath because we know help is here. And then we meet another Selah, another invitation to stop and listen, another invitation to rest. And in this pause, 
consider what is God saying to your heart right now? The third stanza is an invitation. The psalmist is pointing us toward the character of God. How does God work? How does he show up in the face of conflict? It says he makes wars cease all throughout the world, not just here, not just in my world or my sphere. This is the God of creation, the Lord of the cosmos. And it says that he destroys the implements of war. He shatters bows, he breaks spears. The vehicles of war are set ablaze. And into the chaos, he speaks a word. It's a word uh, that causes the earth to melt. It's a word that should cause us to stop in our tracks and wonder, do I hear it? Do you hear it? You might be inclined to think of it like a parent screaming at their kids, stop fighting, because these kids are tearing and clawing at each other over a toy that they didn't care about until two minutes ago when someone else picked it up. And while that's kind of a, an evocative metaphor and maybe an appropriate metaphor, picture this instead. God speaks tenderly and quietly, like a teacher who sees the classroom in chaos and starts an unremarkable gesture, like raising their hand, putting their fingers on their nose or tapping their head until students catch on that the teacher wants their attention. And it's in this subtle and subversive way that the teacher reclaims control over the classroom, not by yelling, it's countercultural. It's other than the world and our hearts are warring and God doesn't try to scream over it all. God whispers, stop fighting and know that I've got this. I'm here, I'm good, I love you and I've got this. In other translations, this verse is, be still and know that I am God. It's a verse that has anchored my wife, Emily, and I in the midst of turbulent seasons. It's a verse we've written about, uh, written above our mirrors and placed in obvious places for daily reminder. It's a verse we wanna see and encounter because it helps settle us in the midst of, of tumultuous change. Stop fighting. Stop squirming. Stop finding yourself enmeshed in all this conflict. Stop trying to defend yourself. Stop trying to be right. Be still. I would contend that the three things our world and our weary hearts need most right now is time spent with God through silence and stillness and solitude. These three are separate but they're just, and they're distinct, but they're also close friends and companions. They go well together. Solitude is the pulling away from people to be alone and not just me time or spa time or self-care time or introverted time, but it's intentionally and intimately time spent with God. To be away from people and to be with God, to draw near. Stillness is the ceasing of our incessant need to be doing something. Choosing to let our hands go idle, choosing to let our minds unplug, choosing to let our time, our productivity, be recklessly wasted and given over to God. Stillness is the stopping of talking and the stopping of all the noise around us. It's the quieting down of the voices that we listen to, the voices, our own voice and our own talking. In C.S. Lewis's spiritual classic, The Screwtape Letters, which is this interesting read where this senior demon is writing uh, to a lesser demon on how to meddle with Christians and, and make a mess. Uh, he, he's writing from the perspective of this senior demon and he says this, he says, music and silence, how I detest them both. No square inch of infernal space and no moment of infernal time has been surrendered to either of these abominable forces, but all has been occupied by noise. Noise, the grand dynamism, the audible expression of all that is exultant, ruthless, and virile. We will make the whole universe a noise in the end. We have already made great strides in that direction as regards the earth. The melodies and silences of heaven will be shouted down in the end, but I admit we are not yet loud enough or anything like it. Research is in progress. Noise. Our world is fraught with it. Our lives are bursting with it. Even good intentions can become noise that clouds and distracts us from being able to hear the still and soft whisper of God. How do we shift away from the bombardment, the constant bombardment of noise in our world? One such way 
would be the contemplative practice of silent prayer. Silent prayer. How are we to discern the voice of God if we are ever talking, ever viewing prayer as a one-way conversation where we call God up and begin the conversation, we talk, 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 and then we end the conversation and hang up? Silent prayer is the other side of the conversation. It's when we stop talking and when we listen. It's when we pause from our, our bombardment of information and we are still. It's when we slow down to a halt and we wait for God to speak. It's when we make space in our inner lives for God to declutter and unravel us and bring peace to the chaos that stirs inside of us all the day long. Uh, author uh, David Benner, in his book, Opening to God, he says this, he says, contemplative prayer or silent prayer it is not so much a type of prayer as something that should be a component of all prayer. It is the silence and space for stillness before God that supports genuine presence and openness to God. Sadly, it is this contemplative dimension that is most lacking from prayer. Communal prayer seldom leaves sufficient space for stillness before God in silence. Even liturgical prayer often leaves inadequate space for silence. And non-liturgical worship experiences, kind of like elevations, are, of course, usually infamously devoid of silence. Intentional times of personal prayer are often rushed and reduced to the basics of petitions, intercession, and possibly an expression or two of gratitude. All this is certainly worthy of being called prayer, but lacking the contemplative dimension. It is not holistic prayer, and it will not be transformational. So here's what I'm proposing. We as people in transition, we as people who are journeying together, we make a priority of infusing our lives with silent prayer that connects us to the presence of God. Here's how I do silent prayer in five steps. And they're not five easy steps because this practice is not an easy one given the world we live in. The first step is solitude. We need to find a place to pull away from people and distractions. We need to mute our phone, turn it off maybe, unplug, quiet the environment. This isn't the time for praise music playing quietly in the background. There are other times for that. Other good times for that. This is not one of those times. The second uh, step here is we sit down, find some place quiet. When we are quiet. We quiet ourselves. We quiet our, our heart. We quiet our breathing. I have a notebook and a writing utensil ready beside you because as you sit and as you idle yourself and quiet your body and slow your breathing, your brain will flood you with ideas because silence is not an idea we are comfortable with. It'll, it'll flood you with things you're worried about, anxiety you'd forgotten about, fears that lay dormant under the surface, stresses, things you had forgotten to do as you sit and are quiet. Don't suppress these thoughts. Don't try, to, don't try to push them down. Instead, write them down. Make note of them on that paper beside you. And then the third thing is an invitation to turn those worries and stresses and ideas you've written down into prayers. Take a moment to surrender them to God, to give thanks for the ideas, to ask for help in areas you're still struggling with. And then when you've exhausted that prayer, go back to the second uh, step, to sit and be quiet and wait. And maybe more things will come and you'll write those down and you'll turn them into prayers and then you'll go back to two and you might go one, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three until you get to a place where you have exhausted your list and your brain is finally slowing down. And this is the fourth step. Sit in silence. Try for five to ten minutes if you can. This is a muscle that maybe you have not used much. It needs exercise and it's going to take some work. Fifth, at the end of your silence, write down what you've heard. Don't rush to this moment. Sit in that silence for a while. And then at the end, take a deep breath. Write down what you've heard. It may be nothing. It might be that in this, uh, the gift of God in this moment is just the silence, the peace. Or maybe a word or a feeling. Maybe you just needed to experience the peace of God as you sat. Whatever it is, make note of it. I want to end with... Zephaniah 3, these words that are a beautiful picture of the tender love of God. And may you experience this as you try your hand at silent prayer this week. Zephaniah 3 says, The Lord your God is among you, a warrior who saves. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will be quiet 
and his love. He will delight in you with singing. That's my prayer for us, for you this week, that as you spend time with the God who is with you and God who loves you, that you would feel the rejoicing over you with gladness. You would feel the warmth and love of his presence, that you would be quieted by it, you'd be stilled by it. You would be still and know that you, that God is, is God and that you are loved. And that you know that he, and that you know that God is delighting in you, over you, with singing. He's singing a love song over you like a parent rocking a child to sleep, like somebody who's helping uh, regulate your uh, unregulated emotions right now. He will delight over you with singing. Amen, friends.